Excellencies, colleagues and uh, friends of development financing, if I may call you that. Good morning and good evening and afternoon, wherever you might be. And a uh, very warm welcome to this kickoff event of the OECD Multilateral Development Finance Week of 2022. This is the, the start of a series of live virtual talks on multilateral development financing starting today, and it will continue until the 8th of December. And all of this is, of course, in conjunction with the launch of the 2022 Multilateral Development Finance Report that just came out today. My name is Henrik Hammergren, and I'm the Executive Director of the Dog Hammerfeld Corporation. And it's my uh, honor to introduce you to this first kickoff session together with Jennifer Topping, the Executive Coordinator, of the multi-partner trust fund office uh, hosted by the UNDP. We're very, very glad to see so many participants that have registered and uh, we sort of also recognize the, the importance of this format that we are able to reach out to so many participants. They say that money talks and that might be true, but sometimes it whispers and unless you sort of amplify it to the way we try to do with both these reports and also by putting things, uh, making things available uh, in, in, in this format, but also on dedicated web uh, pages as the one that we have produced together with the multi-partnership uh, trust fund office. So uh, we will share a link with you uh, in the chat box so you can access this, uh, this uh, a quicker link to our report. But, I would like to start by just appreciating that we are able to host this kickoff event by the, the, the OECD and that we've been trusted to do so. We have for eight years tried to produce a better overview and a better understanding of how the UN system is financed. And we have done so by producing a report that builds on different parts of which the first one presents data on core trends and analysis of expenditure and revenue of the UN financing. Um, for us, uh, it's important also to place this in the broader context of the UN's role in the multilateral system. We are in a situation today where the old saying of follow the money, if you want to understand uh, the system, is more important than ever. What we see is a system that has developed a lot over the year, but it started in a situation where funding was driving change. Today, we're in a different situation. We are still recovering from COVID. We are facing drastic changes in relation to armed conflict trends, especially with the Russian aggression in, in Ukraine, but also realizing the changes that is affecting us all by climate change. With this, it's more important than ever to understand how financing both informs and drives the system. So again, a warm welcome to this, this event and thanks to the OECD for letting us do this kickoff. The format of this event, uh, and I don't wanna go into the details in, but it's gotta be an initial presentation made by Jennifer Topping on just recognizing part one of our report, financing the UN development system and covering the overall trends in financing. And then we will follow up with a round table uh, between thought leaders, if you want, on UN financing. And we hope by that to provide the audience with both the bigger picture, but also the more detailed understanding of the different perspectives of both challenges and linkages and opportunities to improve and make financing more predictable and also useful in terms of quality uh, to provide support for the UN development system. This round table, we will have uh, three speakers, Dr. Silke Weinlich from the Institute of Development and Sustainability of Germany, Susanne Steensen from MOFAN, and also joining us is Per Knutson, Deputy Director at the, develop uh, at the Dr. Hammerfeld Foundation. Para has also served as head of the RC office in Nairobi for five years and has a background at Swedish CEDA. Erik Engberg has been instrumental on our side together with, uh, with, uh, with, with Marlena Rusman on the uh, MPTO side 
will also lead the discussion. So with this scene setter, I'd like to hand over to Jennifer to go into the details of the report. So over to you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. And Henrik, first of all, uh, a big thanks to you for your uh, leadership and um, championship and partnership across all of these um, development finance issues. It's, uh, as you said in the opening, part of this work that I'll present uh, is the expression of a longstanding partnership between the Multipartner Trust Fund Office and the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation. Uh, on UN system and development system financing over many years, um, but it's really uh, complemented by our shared commitment um, to multilateralism and um, the impact and effectiveness of that system. So it's always a pleasure and thanks, uh, as always, for being such a good partner in this. Um, and also as well as you've expressed to the OECD for, for convening multilateral finance um, week uh, and allowing this kind of kickoff session to uh, to begin a dialogue on that uh, on this agenda. So a big thanks to you and to OECD and uh, in advance to our panel members, to Silke, Suzanne uh, and Pele, who it's always a pleasure to be here with. Um, so uh, the big picture, as you said, Henrik, um, as the, the OECD report just released, the multilateral report just released highlights is, you know, when the multilateral system is under pressure uh, to respond to multiple crises and the context that we're facing now, there's even more of a need to remain focused on reform, improved coordination and coherence for the system to be able to perform and to be based on that kind of sustainable and predictable financing. So I was really happy to see that kind of core message coming out of, of the OECD report and it really underpins the work that uh, that we've done together. So um, just to uh, begin my role as, as Henrik mentioned is to kind of set the table a bit before the panel part of the discussion. So I'll do a little bit of the uh, backdrop from the UN Development System Financing Report, um, this last report that was released in September, um, do view a few snapshots as it relates to um, the key aspects of um, multilateral dynamics and the UN development system, uh, and uh, really hope to underscore some of these issues on um, a closer look at the fragmentation and reform issues on funding as it relates to the UN system. So with that in mind, I think I can go to a few slides. Um, I'll wait till I see them appear. Thank you. Yeah, I can go uh, already into the next one. Um, so First of all, what this uh, snapshot tells us here is in the wider picture of the ODA context, as um, this group will be quite familiar with, uh, friends of multilateral finance, as you said, Henrik, at the beginning, uh, the little inset on the left from an OECD report kind of reminds us that while uh, ODA overall has had um, some increases in recent years, modest increases in recent years, in aggregate, that really what was driving those increases is the were that some increased dimensions as they related uh, mainly to COVID and to vaccines. Um, so the the sort of baseline ODA levels um, themselves in the blue bar on the other ODA um, was rather flat or perhaps a slight decrease, but the increase driven by the COVID and uh, vaccine portion. But as we look at um, the multilateral side of that from DAC countries. Um, the bars on the right hand side, what they really show us is that, you know, while the UN development system compared to its multilateral partners uh, has had the fastest growth, the largest and the fastest growth in contributions um, in the last 10 years, 2011 to 2020. Um, what really stands out other than that growth is that the growth is driven 
by uh, overwhelmingly by earmarked contributions to the system and the proportion of the earmarked contributions to the UN development system compared to other multilaterals. So the size of that yellow portion compared to uh, the EU, the World Bank Group, the regional development banks and others is much more significant. So it's a majority share of the UN development system funding, that's about 71% that bar in 2020 um, compared to the others, which are largely uh, majority share core funding. And that really tells us something about uh, what we'll be talking about going forward about predictability, quality, flexible financing um, in the UN development system and overall in the multilateral system and how that presents differently some of this explanation is, of course, the UN's um, um, kind of not distinct, but um, particular role in crisis and humanitarian action, et cetera, which, which lends itself more to the earmarked portion of the funding. But in the next couple of slides, we'll look at unpacking that earmarking and uh, what does it really look at beneath that bar. So I'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is just a snapshot as we look overall at the UN system and how both what is the proportion of the earmarked contributions in relation to the other types of funding in the system. So the circle on the left says this is not the development system now, this is the whole UN system writ large all in, so including humanitarian peace, peacekeeping, uh, peace building, um, all human rights, all functions of the system. Um, and that is 62%. So the overall 62.6 billion is an increase in 2020, 62% of which is some form of earmarked contributions. And then as you can see, 22% on assessed, 8% on voluntary core and 8% on other revenues. So that's the big picture. On the other side of the equation, that bars, the colored bars are a breakout of what, what takes place within that earmarked portion. And so if we break out the types of earmarking in the system, what we see is that the yellow bar, which is the most tightly earmarked, so that's the project and program specific earmarked contribution, the majority of which is kind of from a single contributor to a single agency for a single program. So the, the projectized portion of that earmarked um, component uh, is still 70% of the earmarked funding. So it's gone, the good news is uh, it's gone down from 75% to 70%. So the fragmentation level of the, the tightly earmarked is slightly improved, but it's still 70% of the majority share of the resources of the system. So it still tells us a story of a very fragmented and projectized uh, profile of operations, which of course then um, tells us a story when you go to the follow the money theme that Henrik was referring to, tells us a story about strategy, synergy, impact, coherence, and what runs behind the difficulty of moving that needle. The good part of this picture uh, where the circle is, is that the other colors, the red and the orange, for example, are the parts of the earmarked contributions that are more flexible funding that are, that are emphasized in the funding compact that member states in the UN development system agreed to in 2019. Um, to promote more of. So it's the interagency pooled funds. That's the role that we play in administering that type of instrument in the system that brings the system together more flexibly and the single agency thematic funds. The interagency pooled funds, as we can see, that needle is moving proportionally a little bit up. Um, so 7% overall and more when we look at just the development system. So we are seeing the impact of that reform change, but perhaps um, not quickly enough or um, not very, it's, it, it's, the needle is heading in the right direction, but rather slowly, I guess, is the takeaway there. Next slide, please. Um, so when we take a look at those interagency pooled funds, and we stress this because in the funding compact as an element of what drives reform and financing, 
um, it is really recognized not only in the development system funding compact, but prior to that in the grand bargain for the humanitarian system and also in the reform uh, resolutions on peace building financing. All of these recognize that this sort of interagency pooled funds are key drivers of more synergetic and impactful flexible funding to bring the system together. So if we look at what's happening in that component of the funding, uh, what we see is a positive story in the sense that there's been really sustained growth since 2015, 2016, when Agenda 2030 and the SDG agenda was adopted, needing more synergetic, um, synergetic development work across uh, the system required more synergetic types of funding as well. So that was, I think, one trigger. And then another trigger in the reform agenda, as we said, in humanitarian and development reform, uh, really calling for, in the case of the funding compact, a doubling of the share of this type of interagency pooled funds in, in the mix. Um, and so we see that happening for the first time. This type of funding in the UN exceeded uh, $3 billion. Uh, in 2020, and it was up from that in 2021. Um, uh, and proportionally, uh, as you can see, the UN development system proportion is also, the, the pooled funding as a proportion of the overall development system uh, funding is also increasing, uh, and that goes along with the funding compact target. So it was at 11.7% of UN earmarked funding of that bigger portion is in interagency pooled funds. So that's a big increase, arguably perhaps an underambitious target, um, but um, headed in the right direction. As you can see, the humanitarian pooled funds, um, the volume has also increased, although, it, well, when we look at 2021, where the last bar is not there in this slide, but the volume of the humanitarian pooled funds had, has come up again in 2021, but the proportion of the whole of humanitarian funding is has dropped down. So the proportion that pooled funds represent in humanitarian funding has dropped down. It's going, the increases are going more to um, single agency contributions in the system and not to the pooled funds like the SURF and the country-based pooled funds proportionately, but the volume isn't. I'll go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just a quick snapshot on uh, when we look at the um, funding mix. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, the funding mix overall to the UN development system, um, kind of by contributor. So, in other words, um, not aggregating only the dynamics of the composition of the portfolio to the development system or the humanitarian system. But how does it look when we break out by contributor to the types of uh, the types of contributions? So, you know, I guess the the main takeaway here is that the the level of if we're looking at the quality of funding, so the core and the flexible interagency funds, um, that quality that that composition of quality funding of the blue and the red. Uh, parts of the bar and the gray uh, varies a lot between the major contributors to the system. Um, so while the compact sets targets overall on these portions, uh, individually, of course, member states uh, create the portfolio mix in the way they contribute to the UN in different ways. Some favor core more heavily, some favor the flexible funding more heavily, some favor the more earmarked funding uh, more heavily, but there's quite a bit of variability uh, really between uh, member states on this item, but hopefully the funding compact will help even that out because it does set some benchmarks for what represents uh, quality funding. Core funding uh, is there as 30% um, overall, um, and as we see, it's sort of nearing that target. It's dropped down a little bit, I think, but it's at 27% uh, overall. But agency by agency, that varies a lot. So some agencies really are down in the 10% range. Some of even some of the larger agencies uh, are down with a very low share of 
of core funding and much higher earmarked. Um, so it's really getting some consistency in the path to reach those targets, which is quite a challenge. Um, this also shows the picture of concentration, where, as it says, the top 10 contributors overall represent 55% uh, of funding for uh, development related activities in, um, in 2020. So uh, it's again quite a concentrated picture. Um, there are many contributors, but the, the top 10 larger ones really uh, represent a significant concentration. And in the humanitarian system, it's even more concentrated. The, that top 10 figure is, uh, is above 55%. I think it's more in the 60 something. Um, just to underscore, I think Henrik mentioned it in his opening statement, one of the things, and this is a, um, an invitation to all of you um, who would like to dive in deeper and really interact with a lot of the data um, that's available now. So we, in addition to the re annual reports year by year that we uh, have developed with the Doug Commerce Gold Foundation, this year we've um, developed also an interactive site that's the website there, financingun.report. Um, and that has all of, not only all of the reports themselves, but all of the data and the data visualizations and the uh, short uh, marketplace of ideas, the short analytical papers that have been produced by guest authors in each of the reports, all available and kind of uh, searchable and traceable so that it makes it much more easy, much easier to to really analyze and interact um, with the data available. So I, I absolutely encourage a welcome and invite you to, um, to interact with that, to go there and to please let us know if there's any feedback, ideas, suggestions, things you can't find, uh, please, please do reach out. Um, that's what it's there for. Um, so just a really a few kind of takeaways. It's very hard to summarize what is a really kind of broad based and complex uh, body of work that goes into into this report. But uh, I think it's I have this here because I think it really underlines a lot of the, the mess key messages that um, the OECD report um, focuses on the one that is the multilateral report that has just come out that that kicks off in multilateral week, but also a lot of the work that colleagues on the panel here today have, um, have produced and are producing uh, on the issues of financing reform and multilateralism. So um, uh, Silke and your team at the Institute, uh, the MOPAN studies and work, obviously the related work from the Doug Commerce Gold Foundation on multilateralism and reform. Uh, and they, they, they kind of all have different ways of conveying some of these key messages that with the mounting challenges we are all facing on um, global goods and global challenges on climate, on pandemic conflicts, all the economic agenda, um, there really needs more than ever that stepped up effort in joint responsibility and quality financing. Um, we can't get there with hundreds of thousands of little projects uh, and expect a multilateral system to function effectively. Um, secondly, that in a resource pressured environment um, makes that quality of the UN development system funding critical. And at best, there's a kind of mixed picture of progress in those uh, quality and flexibility targets. So on the pooled funding side, as we see that is moving in the right direction of those targets has done pretty well. The core funding elements, CSS funding elements, um, it's not the same story. Um, and that compact is a compact. It's not a pick and choose thing because they do complement each other. Um, so getting that better funding mix will really need more, even more sustained commitment and ambition in a time of pressure. Um, and then on the sustainable funding of SDGs and innovation and integrated financing, all the things that we've been working on together to underpin the SDGs more effectively, um, the, the, the importance of better data tracked to SDG goals and outcomes. So financial data tracked to SDG goals and outcomes um, is really, really important. And that's uh, something that 
has been worked on by the system is also underscored um, in the quality features in the in the funding compact but it, we really need to kind of keep an eye on it um, and keep working on that and the the system has done a lot on the financial data standards um, and is starting to publish more and more agencies are publishing their financial data in this direction according to those agreements but it really it sounds a bit geeky but it is a very important thing to be able to track resources to results and to the results on the STG agenda that we all ascribe to. So um, that's something that we'll continue to work on um, uh, really as part of this quality conversation. Uh, I think that is my last slide. I hope I didn't go too much over time and I hope that uh, sets the table effectively for um, the colleagues to follow on the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, with that, I would like to turn directly to um, Eric Engbei, who will then lead us into the roundtable discussion. So may I turn to you? Thank you so much, Henrik. And thank you, Jennifer, for this excellent presentation that really sets the stage for this next component of our event, which is a roundtable discussion with, uh, as Henrik mentioned, three panelists. Susan Stenson from Mopan, Silke Weinlich from the German Institute of Development and Sustainability, and uh, Per Knudsen from the Dog Hammerfeld Foundation. So for this roundtable discussion, I will ask three questions that we have prepared to the panel. And then after that, it will be an opportunity for the audience to also provide their questions for the panelists. And you can do that by entering your questions in the Q&A function that you find on the lower end of your screen. We will go through all of these questions while the roundtable discussion is ongoing and then address uh, the, the questions that most people seem to uh, want to know about at the end of this session. So let me then start by uh, presenting the first theme and the first question that, that we would uh, like to ask our panelists which is, what are the main drivers behind earmarking? And what role can finance play in creating incentives to reduce fragmentation of the UN effort? And for this question, maybe I could start by handing over the floor to Susan Stenson for uh, a first reflection on this theme. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric, and uh, thank you, colleagues. And it's really good to see all of you, and uh, and it's great to sort of uh, be there to kick it kick it off. And I think that uh, from a Mopan perspective, I think we have sort of uh, hopefully some yeah some constructive inputs to sort of uh, nurture this uh, conversation. So uh, I think where where we're coming out from is that we just recently met our our members at our sort of board session and uh, and that was under our Swiss uh, chairmanship and uh, and what was good to sort of really note was sort of uh, the reaffirmation of uh, the Mopan network's commitment to multilateralism I think no no Mopan member is uh, is not there if they didn't believe in multilateralism so I think uh, the Mopan instrument is really sort of a testament to that commitment and uh, obviously it was sort of the uh, the commitment is about, of course, global challenges do require global solution and uh, also an affirmation that the multilateral institutions, including the UN, are central to uh, really uh, offering those global solutions. And I think uh, just for the audience, uh, um, the standpoint of MOPAN is that uh, is important to sort of keep in mind because together the MOPAN network members, they represent roughly uh, $80 billion uh, investment into the multilateral system every year. So it is the large shareholders and uh, it was reassuring to really sort of get uh, a reaffirmment of that commitment. What is obvious and also uh, both Henrik and uh, Jennifer sort of um, yeah, alluded to that or mentioned it specifically, uh, it is obvious through our daily work, we do see uh, multilateral institutions uh, operating under increasing uh, pressure and stress. 
and they are sort of it's a matter of sort of how do you balance the the, the increasing demands uh, but also increasing risk they are offering a much more riskier environment and they are facing polarized interest uh, at times they are also facing scandals and uh, and of course uh, this sort of complex picture can result in uh, mistrust sort of how do you square that relationship and uh, and I think I'll claim that the routes uh, to include increased earmarking uh, would need to be linked to sort of uh, the the trust, the contract that is not fully working. And um, and uh, we all know, and uh, Jennifer, you spoke uh, very well to that, that earmark is also there to target specific issues, to, to scale, to test. Uh, it has its raison d'etre. Um, at the same time, it's important to really sort of appreciate uh, the quality of uh, those type of uh, instruments. Of course, earmarking is also there to promote um, donors' national interests, and uh, it does allow, uh, we see our members to better sell those investments, and uh, particularly to an increasingly skeptical political leadership and uh, the taxpaying public who are really questioning this on a daily basis. So, uh, so it's somewhat a little bit of a vicious circle, if you can say. Um, it's, and uh, increased uh, earmarking does lead to increased fragmentation, as we all know. And uh, and of course, it's sort of compounding itself a little bit sort of in a downward spiral. Um, and I think what we all can do is sort of make a contribution to rebuilding trust and uh, because it will require an effort uh, from donors, from uh, agencies, from the UNs, including the UN system. And um, but I would like to sort of uh, leave sort of um, um, not an anecdote, but sort of uh, an evidence from the study we conducted on COVID, which is that um, that was uh, that crisis was a strong testament, I think, to uh, the trust in the multilateral system. And uh, we saw an extreme reliance on the institutions. They were the only boots on the ground and uh, in the early stages of the pandemic. And also they were the only one equipped to actually address transboundary issues. And, um, and uh, we saw actually early on in the crisis uh, an, an openness to provide much more flexible resources, right? And, uh, and you can also see this in the numbers, um, but gradually uh, donors did revert back to, uh, to tightening their earmarking. And, uh, and of course that was partly due to the challenges in meeting reporting accountability requirements, the interoperability of the systems and so forth. So uh, um, one thing we would like to uh, add, to sort of contribute with on the way forward, because I think it's important to keep this conversation alive to in order to find, uh, to promote better understanding, but also find solutions, is that we are currently assessing uh, a, a quite an important cohort of UN entities. And uh, so we've just completed some, doing some, and about to start another set. And uh, we are setting ourselves a challenge to sort of uh, build on what we see on uh, earmarking from those uh, assessments to really understand the, the effect on organizational performance. So, uh, and also to have a frank conversation about in what condition this is warranted and uh, what are the conditions and systems and practices uh, you need to have in place to build towards uh, much better quality funding. And, uh, and but it takes two to tango. So it's not just about the, the organizations, it's also important that uh, we really co-op the donors in this conversation. So I really sort of invite all, all listeners and the panel members to keep an eye out from uh, for this uh, conversation. And I will look forward to, yeah collaborating on this. But uh, over to you, Eric. I hope it wasn't too long. Not at all. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for those words. I, I, it was really interesting to hear about uh, these drivers and also how this issue can also feed into your work on the organizational assessments of different UN entities. And uh, I, for one, really look forward to reading uh, those assessment reports afterwards. 
Um, maybe then I can hand over the floor to uh, Dr. Silke Weinlich uh, to, to, uh, to follow up with her reflections on this theme. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much, Henrik, and also Susan. It's a great pleasure to uh, for also for IDOS uh, to co-host this event with you and Mopan and the Multi-Partner Trust Fund Office. And it's also great to be part of yet another OECD Multilateral Finance Week. It's the second time and maybe it's uh, the beginning of a tradition there. And of course, it's always wonderful to be able to draw on sort of Jennifer's tableau on Jennifer's um, sort of outlining the big picture that always makes it easier to for, sort of uh, to argue afterwards. Um, Susan, you stole my thunder a bit, I have to say, right? Because you uh, outlined many of the, the sort of the push factors that I wanted to draw on. Uh, but in my remarks here, I will uh, rely on the research that my team, Max Otto Baumann, Sebastian Hauck and I have been doing on earmark funding, as well as on the UN development system reform and also on assess contributions. And I noticed also uh, some other researchers are here in the audience, so I think I will also sort of tip my hat to them and use some of their insights. Um, before sort of going into what drives earmarking on, and how, um, what in, in the positive and the negative sense maybe also, I would like to look back in history and remind ourselves that earmarking has been going on for nearly three decades. Uh, in the UN system at least. And in 1993, I looked it up for this event. That was basically the last time that core and earmarked funding for UN operational activities were roughly at par, right? So 50-50. And uh, the overall funding in 1993 stood at 7 billion US dollars. So that's quite a contrast to the numbers that Jennifer has been presenting. But, and it is, has been quite a journey uh, from 1993 to now. Uh, so, but what I want to say with this is that while many of the key drivers behind earmarking are probably still similar, they have been interacting and the whole picture got much more complicated. And this makes it even harder to sort of rein in the detrimental side of this funding pattern, which uh, as we will also discuss has also positive sides. So let me quickly go, go through the push factors that Susan also mentioned, thematic funding, uh, Member states want to specify geographically where funding should go, thematically, gender is becoming more important, the climate, the nexus, and the OECD report also told us in times of crisis, this kind of earmarking is becoming even more important. At the same time, it's about more accountability, taxpayers at home who want to know what results are achieved by German, British, Danish money. Um, another factor that is often mentioned is that of control, although there we don't really have a lot of hard evidence. Um, I think Bernhard Reinsberg is in the, the, um, the audience. Uh, but through earmarking, what is true, I think, is that donors can shape and direct the agenda and activities of UN entities to a greater degree than through core cool funding, mainly because it's a bilateral agreement very often. And basically, it can be ensured that the own priorities are not watered down by conflicts among um, sort of the preferences of the other 192 member states, right? So it's easier to, to direct the funding to thematic priorities. But when these pull factors basically talk about or look at um, contributors to the UN system as managers with financial responsibilities that seek to spend their funding effect effectively and efficiently, but I think it's really important to also shift the perspective and look at member states as stakeholders of the multilateral system. And then I come to another topic that Susan already mentioned, which is trust. And I think it's an overarching observation, um, which has also been a consistent topic of the OECD reports. Despite rhetoric on the contrary, and this rhetoric is, I think, increasing, I do think there's a deep mistrust of many member states, both from the global north and also probably for other reasons from the Global South, vis-a-vis -vis the UN and a greater role beyond aid. Yeah? Um, and I don't think that this mistrust is only, uh, has something only to do with effectiveness and efficiency, but it's also about trust in an organization which is owned by 193 member states with very different political systems and political priorities. And that's, I think, is a key problem and I hope we could discuss this. But talking about the push factors, we can also talk about the pull factors, and then it's easy. I mean, 
is well known, probably rather simple. Most UN entities depend fully or to a large degree on voluntary contributions. They are resource dependent and they were back in the days all too eager <laughs> to accept the earmarked funding that came in at a time when the overall economic outlook was rather not very rosy. But since then, a lot has happened, and we have described that elsewhere as sort of the emergence of business models that are geared towards short term project and program specific fund ra funding raised at the country level. Uh, we see that many UN entities have decentralized their fundraising to the country level. UN staff is rewarded for funds that they raise as part of the performance assessment. There's a lot of opportunity seeking behavior. And that translates not too rarely into mission and mandate creep. And uh, that is, yeah, overall a problem. And I think that's a bit the vicious circle that you described. Or it's another facet of the vicious circle. And up to now, I've mainly, mainly talked about the most dominant form of earmark funding, which um, Jennifer pointed out, sort of single entity funding tied to projects or programs. But uh, we argued there are many shades to earmark funding in a report in 2019. And indeed, there are also forms of earmark funding that make UN entities work together. And this is actually something that core funding cannot do, since core funding is entity specific. And we actually heard time and again in interviews at the country level that funding is needed to bring UN entities together to make them work across sectors and um, at a greater scale. But I think I leave it to, uh, to pair to go more into the details of uh, what sort of uh, joint funding can bring about in terms of making UN entities to work together. Thank you, Eric. So shall I go on, Eric? Yes, please, please go on. Uh, please go on, Per. Thank you so much, and and uh, I will not repeat all the the praise. I just want to echo it, uh, and I also want to say, uh, you know, I'm I'm deeply I feel privileged to to see 119 participants on screen. It's this is one of the the backsides of Zoom that you don't feel the presence, but I'm trying to visualize more than 100 people in this seminar. So hello, everybody. Uh, uh, let me try to build on what you have said. Uh, I, I share the dilemmas that you have pointed out, but I also want to to shake them up a little bit. Uh, I've been uh, uh, just came back from a facilitated dialogue on the funding compact at the country level. And, and I must say, if we start with the dilemmas that you pointed out, what drives fragmentation? Uh, when, when, when we have spoken in, in semi-structured conversations in seven, 70 of them across four continents and now going deep in between heads of corporation in Kenya with heads of agencies and also the presence of the government, uh, I, I think you are very right when you point out that member states often refer to, to, to political limitations, the parliaments and so forth, give them limited leeway. Uh, but if you look at figures, some of these countries and many of them actually do contribute to joint approaches despite these limitations. So it shows that there are dynamics. Uh, where you actually step out of the normal. And the interesting question is then, why do you do that? What's the motivating factor from going uh, from, from the more earmarked into the joint, despite those limitations? The second point that you, you brought is thematic priorities. So bilateral strategies uh, influencing policy on very important subjects that, that have support in, in, a, in, a, in a member state country, be it gender equality or anti-corruption and so forth. Uh, and here, of course, uh, that's the thematic priority is tightly connected with visibility. Uh, you know, getting the trust of using taxpayers' funds uh, depend on the achievements that you communicate back. But when you, again, when you look at uh, uh, at real results at the country level and you listen to both member states and uh, UN agencies, there are also uh, significant results 
where they have achieved uh, visibility on contributions rather than attributions, where their thematic priorities have been integrated into larger results, uh, enabling you know, both uh, a bilateral strategy uh, impacting on bigger results in a multilateral package. I will come back to those examples in a second. If I look then at the UN agency dilemma, uh, 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 this is not a sinister, uh, you know, deliberate move to undermine UN coherence, but it's a, a responsibility of trying to pursue your agency mandate to be relevant to the constituency of member states uh, in in be it health or be it gender equality. But it becomes a dilemma if it becomes in opposition to uh, joint programming and UN system coherence. And there need not be such uh, a dichotomy or uh, traction. So we need a minimum of core for agencies to play their international role of expertise. But if we are going to succeed in SDG programming, there is no way that a bilateral or a single agency can deliver that goods. So when I provoke a little bit, uh, what are the results that that, that I discussed then with member states ranging from the EU to Korea and Japan. And, and last week in those discussions, uh, when we got into you know, discussing, so what do we want to achieve together, the real results? Uh, member states and the UN pointed, for instance, to the election basket where, uh, where um, uh, a number of member states, also those who normally say we can't do joint programming, they are all in that basket and they share a reporting. Visibility on contribution is solved by people reporting back having a stake in this. And I think the, the repurposing of funding towards COVID uh, that you referred to, Susan, is also extremely uh, important, even though it at times separated into bilateral offerings. But, and if I then come to the last question uh, that you brought up, that is so significant, what builds trust? I think that, that financing, uh, 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 creating incentives for better results is is less to do with the UN understanding the preference of individual donors and more to do with identifying shared analysis of the, the, the uh, assumption and results where many partners are required to achieve the results, to optimize taxpayers' resources to impact on people's lives. And if I take uh, that example uh, into the Kenyan context and that discussion, uh, trust is enough uh, uh, to bring partners together in response to the drought in the north. So what is separated uh, into tightly earmarking on the development budget by the same partner in the same country suddenly uh, member states and the UN are using UN instruments uh, uh, and uh, a UN coordinations through the RC and the international NGOs and, 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 and UN agencies together with the government. And the UN is convening a dialogue across the, the national uh, authority for disaster management uh, going into the planning uh, ministry of ministry of finance so i am not saying that un can go easy on trust on the contrary but it is a shared responsibility between the un if I draw conclusions from the conversation between member states and the un and there is enough trust to use coordinated mechanisms in some situations. So we have to go beyond 
those assumptions and see where do we really achieve bigger results together? How do we do it? And what kind of reporting is then acknowledging both uh, bilateral thematic priorities, creating visibility, but producing bigger results? And, 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 and that is in contrast of going alone and doing good results, but not uh, reaching the goals uh, and the priorities of a country. Thanks, I'm stopping there. Thank you so much, Per, for, 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 for this, uh, these words. And I think uh, this has been a very interesting discussion around this theme. And I think we really managed to identify basically the main drivers, the main push and pull factors, and also some things that can be, do, can be done to build the trust required. And I would now like to, us to move into the next question, which is, will be, help us to make the case why we really need better UN financing. And this question is, how could better financing for the UN system enable better results? in terms of SDG integration, cross-border program, uh, cross programming and inclusion, which were focuses of the human reform. And also with regards to uh, concepts that have been put forth with uh, our common agenda, such as uh, the delivery of global public goods. So uh, with this uh, new question, maybe I can turn first uh, towards Silke, if you would like to start off this uh, conversation this time around. Sure. Uh, yeah, of course, I, I'm itching to reply also to Pierre Vidal, um, sort of uh, focus on the, the question of uh, how better financing translates into sort of better results. And um, I would also, again, sort of ask you to take a step back and think about what better financing for the UN system means. And in a way, Jennifer also alluded to it, we, we have set it out, right? Member States and the UN agreed on uh, the funding compact and where it is specified. It's a solid foundation of co-funding. It's a higher share of more flexible forms of earmarked funding, including interagency funds. It's a reliable funding of the sort of, what is the system-wide backbone, the RC system. And it's also, and we should not forget that, it's not a donor discussion. It's a funding by a larger number of member states who also have to own the system, right? And you said it, I mean, in, in essence, it's the promise of the reform that such better quality funding translates into better results in areas such as integrated policy advice, cross-border, global public goods. And the question is, uh, have we evidence for that already? Or is it a promise? And I would uh, like to pick up the notion of business models because I think it's, it's helpful and look at it in a way from a bird's eye perspective. And I think um, better financing would allow UN entities at the country level the, to become more mission and mandate driven and to, to enable them to, together with other entities to really mobilize interagency and cross-sectoral expertise and policy support that is better aligned with uh, the multiple crises hitting at the same time at country level with what governments and their uh, societies really need. And that does not mean that uh, UN entities should stop altogether being contractors and accepting single entity project and program specific funding. It's, there are many reasons why as to why this is still valid. And there might be also in demand by, uh, by host governments. And it's, it's a question of a ratio. And it should just not be their main raison d'etre to be contractors or implementers. And I think um, such better funding it, with all the aspects in, in the funding conflict, including a, a stronger or a better funded RC system would allow then UN entities to position themselves as stronger partners for countries and help them make the tough choices on the trade-offs between the social, the economic, environmental dimensions that they are facing, everyone is facing at the moment, where to put the money, which group to sort of support, which crisis to tackle first. And uh, sort of UN entities, which are supported by resident coordinators in their offices and can pool their own expertise, will be much better positioned in that regard. 
And they would also be better positioned to be conveners, credible conveners, and accepted by development partners, the way you just described it, Per, but also by the international financial institutions, which have the money. We see the big global public goods funding going to the regional development banks, and rightly so. But how do we bring this together? And we have to have UN entities which can convene together with, of course, the, 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 the governments, but also helping governments to tap into new resources and new, new funds in order to, to answer the crises which are there. And last but not least, I think it's also important that such funding enables UN entities at the country level to better become transmission belts for global norms and values in times of rising autocracy and narrowing spaces for civil society. And I don't mean that all UN entities have to do the same by that, but they have to be united uh, and they have to uh, have a division of labor between the RC and other uh, heads of UN entities and bring home really strong messages on norms and values. And I think that's where we need the UN most at the moment. And where do we stand with regard to evidence on that? I think uh, what we found in our study is there is a beginning of that. We were far away from a systemic repositioning maybe also due to the fact that the funding has not really been really shifting, right? I mean, funding is not the only reason, but it has a huge impact at the country level. But I would say that the potential is there. Thank you so much, Silke. And I think it's really interesting how you make this link to the role of the UN system and uh, maybe de-emphasizing de or moving away slightly from a role of an implementer and contractor and how better funding could help the UN to strengthen its role as a convener, as an advisor to governments on strategic priorities, and also as a defender of global norms. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to hand over the floor to, to Susan for, for, to follow up on, uh, on these elements. Uh, thank you very much. I think Silke is a tough one to follow up on. <laughs> to, um, I think, when thinking about this uh, how question, it's, it's actually one of the trickiest set of questions you have on this uh, panel, actually. Uh, I was about to write to you and say, what? <laughs> um, I think it's really important to reflect on the geopolitical environment, uh, which has really shifted, I think, even more significantly over the recent years. Uh, from where we sit, um, we see an ODA aid environment, which is under increasing pressure. And, um, and of course, we are, as we've already mentioned uh, many, many, many times, we are facing um, the effects of uh, COVID, which are now further compounded by the war with uh, in Ukraine, uh, the downstream effects, uh, the growing domestic pressures, um, also, I think sort of when you walk around in societies, you are facing a constant debate about the increasing cost of living. And uh, this is compounding this whole picture uh, where we need to actually factor that in as we are debating this conversation about the quality of funding. And uh, because I think this pressure picture really is uh, is having an impact on the quantity and the quality of the funding as we sort of project ourselves going forward. So, of course, from a MOPAN perspective, sort of uh, in our daily work, every we have the standpoint of every dollar counts, of course. And uh, so not only does um, the right funding have to arrive, uh, but the multilateral system and the institutions uh, are really called to continuously uh, demonstrate um, an improvement of performance. The bar is sort of continuously lifting up, but is also, I think, uh, going in pair with the scale of the challenges are also uh, really increasing. Um, from sort of in, in the conversation we have with our members, uh, what we really sort of, the deep sense we have is that it's an expectation that their investment of uh, the scarce ODA resources will deliver results where they're most needed. And uh, perhaps this question is uh, where to best invest those resources, I think uh, needs some rethinking. 
And um, so what issues are the most pressing? How should they be tackled and by who? I think is important to actually add into this conversation. How can the system at large better work together? And here, and that sort of uh, constant plea I have is that it's not just about the UN system. It's also about, and that's something we really sort of, uh, I, I hope revealed pretty well, it's about how the UN works in conjunction with uh, the IFIs, the MDBs, the regional uh, bodies, uh, the vertical funds, the private sector, and vice versa, of course. But is really to see that not just as sort of uh, a system, a closed system, but is actually an open system. So uh, that's important to actually put some some reflection into that. And um, from in in the MOPEN space, we are currently sort of embarking in a in a strategic reflection, also on our own direction. And uh, we brought together uh, a set of um, 16, uh, it's many, but uh, um, sort of senior level multilateral thinkers and both from our members, but also from outside growth from the multilateral system, but also independent thinkers to really reflect over the coming years uh, around sort of this complex geopolitical and financing environment. And um, we are asking them to really debate uh, about the multilateral system, where it should focus, prioritize. But also, I think you alluded to that, uh, Silke, it's, uh, it's a matter of discussing actually what's the right mix of functional roles. So here we are thinking about a normative versus operational versus dispute, conflict resolution versus financial uh, role. And, um, and what works in what circumstances what do you need in place? Um, and I think here it's important to keep in mind that better financing, better quality financing, doesn't necessarily lead to better results. I think that's, uh, let's uh, let's keep uh, or assert that. And that wouldn't lead to better results if you don't have set your goals clear. So that's, uh, of course, we have the overarching goals, the SDGs, but still, how do they translate actually at the agency, at the country level? It's, uh, yeah, the complexity is, uh, and of course, from uh, sort of uh, where, we, what we do is that we then granularly look at uh, the systems and practices, uh, what are, what is in place. And um, so that's, uh, and of course, in all the in, in this sort of uh, complex debate, I think uh, we also need to reflect on how MOPEN members, uh, the system, some important shareholders of the system, in volume terms uh, large, uh, um, how can they best support these efforts, uh, including through better sort of commitment to quality financing? So um, I think I've sort of gone many ways to try to tackle your question, which I found tricky. But I think one one contribution we would like to bring back to this debate is really uh, is the outcome of the deliberation of this group over the coming year, and also find a mechanism whereby we can also uh, have this group actually uh, leverage on uh, on the international debate we are having. So I'll pass the floor back to you, Eric. Thank you so much, Susan. And um, I, I think it, it, it's really interesting to think about the fact that, you know, the, Funding per se doesn't really guarantee the better results, but they might they might contribute, depending also which roles are effective in which environment, and also depending on the larger context and other actors involved. And uh, it seems very interesting to also follow uh, the outcome of uh, this group and 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 hear what they uh, what they will discuss and conclude in the following years. So we'll definitely be looking forward to hearing more from them. Uh, I will now hand over the floor to uh, Per to, to uh, provide the final reflections on this theme. Uh, you're muted, Per. I, thank you. I was just saying I, I'm fortunate enough to come last all the time so I can build on the brilliant minds of Silke and Susan here. Uh, and I will try to add a little bit to it. I think, uh, first of all, uh, 
let's demystify financing. Financing is always a means to resource something to achieve a result. So if you talk about quality financing for better results, you have to ask the question first, what result to, uh, uh, to be able to answer the, the question about quality financing. And if I go to, to, to reality then to uh, investigate that question from a beneficiary or from a taxpayer's perspective, uh, if it was a, a policy uh, a development on public uh, private funding, then uh, I would maybe, you know, the effective funding could be uh, earmarked funding to UNIDO to use its expertise to help the government develop that policy. So that wouldn't require a, a joint up complex approach. But if we look back at all the great things that the UN has uh, been at the center of uh, achieving together with private sector and national authorities and expert uh, institutions, uh, delivering much more complex results. We can take examples like uh, uh, av aviation safety or meteorology, uh, or we can go to the Horn of Africa today and, and look at the problem analysis of, of resilience building on the Horn of Africa. Immediately, you, you have a set of uh, components to achieve that result that brings in water distribution, governance issues, community uh, uh, voice, uh, together with county government and national government security aspects. And we know that. So uh, we, we need to, uh, to, to look at financing as a resource to achieve results and where UN has the unique role uh, to convene complex results, as you said, S Susan, uh, to bring uh, you know, uh, the key stakeholders together from the IFIs to, to local authorities and, and others, then there has to be a certain um, uh, leeway in the financing for you and to meet member state expectations. If you if you have projectized funding or tightly earmarked funding, you would tie the UN to output uh, production, and that could you know work in in the the singular policy development example. But if we are addressing uh, you know the root causes of conflict, then you immediately look at uh, UN's both normative convening and operational contributions together with others. Uh, and this is where I, I believe that there needs to be much more of a, a country-based and a regional dialogue uh, around the global commitments on quality funding and the funding compact from a results perspective. Maybe not everything needs to be joint programming, but if you look at the big, uh, the big ticket items as conflict prevention, uh, climate transition, uh, uh, forced migration or radicalization, these are complex results that no individual or no project earmarking can handle. And that's why you need flexible and predictable funding to create conditions to tackle those results. Thank you so much, Per, for that. And uh, I think we can now move on to the last question we had prepared for this round table. Uh, I, this has been a very rich discussion so far. And uh, we had a lot to say, every one of us, and we are, are now approaching the last 15 minutes of the event. So I, I think we will um, have to stick to a bit uh, shorter or briefer responses to this last question. But I also think that we already alluded to it a few times during our discussion. So the last question, it goes, how could the UN system build the trust among donors and leverage lessons learned current initiatives and good examples to pave the way for more flexible and predictable UN financing. 
Maybe then I could uh, start by handing the floor over to Susan if you want to start off uh, uh, on this last question for this session. Thank you, Eric. And uh, I promise I won't be uh, too long. Um, so first of all, I would actually like to uh, celebrate a little bit MOPAM in this uh, in this conversation. Uh, we we've turned twenty this year, and I think we've sort of uh, on this journey uh, made our contribution to sort of forge this trust. We are sort of culminating our celebration with a high level event in Geneva on the 12th of December. And uh, I would really like to invite everybody uh, to, to sort of uh, tune in to that event um, because it's a dialogue with our members and with the uh, multilateral partners, leaders, and also with uh, uh, partner countries. So it's, it's really important that we, uh, it's only multilateralism is also about having conversations. And that's important. Uh, that's that. That is the important value of multilateralism, and we, we need to continue uh, nurturing this. So I alluded to uh, the work we've done on COVID nineteen. So the snappy title of our report is uh, "More Than the Sum of Its Part." So an analytical study on multilateral performance in response to COVID nineteen. So. Uh, I think it says uh, it says a lot that title, but um, one thing we had really set ourselves to understand is what was happening among within multilateral organizations and also in sort of the contract with member states doing during the pandemic, so early phase during and also as the pandemic was sort of, uh, um, uh, yeah, scaling down, if you can see. Um, I think one of the main lessons, and I think, uh, Jennifer, you you hopefully uh, uh, smile to that and, uh, and then nod to it, uh, is that uh, we confirm that fragmentation in resource mobilization has contributed to competition among a multilateral organization. It's worked against joint programming, undermined the achievement of collective outcomes. And, um, and of course, during the COVID response, the lack of centralized resource uh, management mechanism and over-reliance on some core set of donors, uh, underfunding of pooled mechanisms all contributed to this issue. And um, so uh, what we've also what we also saw was that donors were confronted with fragmented financing appeals and financing actually ultimately favoring a vaccine despite the importance of uh, diagnostic and therapeutic. So uh, I think you'll be delighted to hear that sort of uh, from that sort of those findings, our main policy recommendation was to ensure adequate capitalization of pool funds and use of resource mobilization mechanism to incentivize scale up of programming across UN, MDBs and IMF and other partners. So um, what we are really sort of hoping this piece of work can actually lead to is to actually uh, tease out the lessons learned, but also put it up to the international community to cultivate those recommendations. So because it's only by the debate we are, for instance, nurturing in our strategy group that we can also make that contribution to rebuilding trust between uh, the shareholders and the system. So um, yeah, it is important that uh, everybody plays its part and that uh, I think I've set myself that challenge to also contribute to uh, nurture um, healthy debate with our members uh, because it's a two-way street here to ensure that we can sort of uh, get to a point of uh, much more uh, sustainable and quality uh, financial sort of contract with the multilateral system. And I would just like to sort of end on the note of, we all know about sort of uh, the uh, the WHO example, which is sort of setting a standard pretty high, right? And um, it's, it's something that has been years in working. This has started years ago, this conversation. Of course, the crisis has sort of, uh, you know, amplified and put some acceleration in finding some targets. But it's some, so it's how do we nurture actually this conversation and make sure that we actually can, can, 
yeah pivot to concrete uh, commitments so that uh, we all can yeah can can build trust in the system and uh, have uh, even better performing multilateral system so uh, i'll end here and say that uh, well i think well thank you eric <laughs> for uh, for at least bringing us to this third segment thank you so much Susan, for sharing all of that and uh I have to say, personally, I really enjoyed reading uh, the Mopan COVID-19 study. It was extremely interesting to read all the lessons learned, uh, identified through in, in that paper. And uh, then I would just like to hand over the floor to maybe Silke for a, a follow-up reflection on, on this theme. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll also be brief and I'll pick on um, Suzanne's example of the WHO because that's also something which I've been studying and also been thinking about quite a lot, right? So why, what were the conditions that brought about this multilateral success story that uh, the WHA took the historic decision of increasing the share of assessed contributions, I think from 16 to 50 uh, by 2028. So it hasn't happened yet, right? And there are a number of strings attached to this decision. But um, is it really such a unique case? Is it the pandemic, the pressure from academia, civil society, expert panels that have been building up, or can it be replicated? And uh, I mean, it's hard to tell. I've argued elsewhere, it's probably not easy to replicate, and I still, I still probably believe that. But I think the WHO has, example, has something to tell also for other UN entities because uh, of the funding dialogues and the way the WHO has been setting up its budget. I think it has been a forerunner there in the UN system and other entities could draw on this and making more visible the gaps in, in their own thematic work uh, and sort of what is funded by which type of funding. And there we talk also about funding, uh, functions maybe, right? And maybe we can also start by that uh, discussion among member states, which is probably not easy, but maybe also in sort of relation with the, our common agenda process, there can be a discussion about what are global governance functions of UN entities that need to be funded by core funding because they have their integrity has to be protected. They have to be impartial. And what is uh, funded or what, what is, where is it easier to fund things through earmarking? Um, but I, I do think, I mean, on the one hand, it is about UN entities opening up, being transparent, showing what they do. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the onus is also quite a lot on member states here. On the one hand, to make it work with the WHO. But also, I mean, I think here geopolitics comes in quite a bit. And the discussion to, to have assessed contributions um, is in a way surprising. I mean, the, the setup we have at the moment is we have a lot of earmarked funding contributed by traditional Western donors and uh, countries that do maybe not share the liberal um, sort of direction underpinning China has a lot of success contributions still in its funding mix, but also other countries from the global south are rising emerging countries do not resort to earmarking to an extent that uh, Western countries do. And the question is, will that ever change and what happens then? And so in that regard, the assessed contributions and sort of multilaterally uh, agreed policies protect much more of a, a, a protection against uni unilateral priority setting, right? And I think this needs to be also in the discussion um, in, in a situation we are having at the moment. And I stop here. Thank you so much, Silke. I think that was really interesting to, to stress the, the, the actual geopolitical background and maybe the difference between in terms of uh, values or political systems between a lot of UN member states that might definitely affect some of the funding allocations. And now I would just like to hand over the floor to Per for a few final words on this topic before I, I leave uh, a hand over to uh, afterwards to Henrik and Jennifer for, for our concluding remarks. Over to you, Per. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I also want to salute uh, Mopan uh, on this study uh, uh, and urge all of you who have not yet read it to read it. Uh, I think this is a great piece of work. Um, I also I want to supplement what has been already said by two things. One, um, uh, 
the UN showed uh, in the repurposing exercises that it could respond to uh, change in very quick ways. Uh, working around the clock in many countries, uh, uh, joint strategies in response to 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 the COVID showed, you know, in contrast to what many say is a slow and bureaucratic system, uh, this showed uh, that uh, it can play a very dynamic role. And that said, with all the shortcomings that that still remained uh, with the repurposing, uh, so that's a, a a positive aspect to take into other uh, uh, works that require um, multi-stakeholder responses. And the second point, because so much has been said and the, and the study is there, is, is that it's, we need to reflect on the, the, the numbers now in terms of when we are in a situation with, with, with money being really under strain, if we take the whole UN development budget, you know, we, we get to 18, 20 billions. And if we add the humanitarian budget through UN, we get to, to close to 50 billion. And if we look at the call for budgeting for the entire SDG, people were very reluctant to consider a global bill of $5 trillion a year for an investment into increased resilience and reduced poverty. If we look at IMF's estimate uh, of the cost for COVID-19 alone, and mind us, very little of resilience have been built by that investment, but a lot of fantastic mitigations and saving lives have been uh, catered with those costs. But that cost, in contrast to the SDG 5 trillion, that cost is estimated by the IMF to $13.5 trillion. So if we look at you know, the challenges ahead, uh, and we then ask ourselves, with the financing we have at hand, how do we want to, uh, to use that to blend resources, to, to, to integrate each other's roles and functions. Uh, when you get into that dialogue at the country level, this is where also I think host countries become uh, much more interested and engaged. And you, I think you brought it out, Susan. It's incredibly interest, important that we bring in the country leadership themselves around these issues. You know, where do we want to be? Where do we need to be in 10, 15 years time? And what is the response required? And therefore, how do we shift our funding patterns to come close to that? So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Per. And uh, I have to say, it's been an extremely rich and interesting discussion to follow and be part of, and I'm, I'm really grateful to everyone who joined, both participants and panelists. And with those words, I would like to hand over for, to Jennifer and then Henrik for uh, concluding remarks. Thank you. I don't know if you want to start, Jennifer, but I, um, I'm happy to leave the last word for you as well. I, I was uh, going to do the opposite. So I'll give you the last word. We'll go in reverse order. Um, but thank you, um, Eric, thanks for uh, bringing us together and facilitating such an interesting um, and rich discussion. And um, really to follow on that, that panel um, uh, makes it easy to make a few closing reflections because it was such a, um, uh, a well-focused set of contributions. So I would maybe just make a few final comments quickly. Uh, one, I guess, goes back to this notion that was the thread of this um, event, which is about change, you know, and uh, change, of course, is inevitable. Change takes different forms at different times. We're, we're facing a certain version of it uh, globally now. But um, in embracing that change and um, optimizing and managing it, that's, that's the kind of 
essential element for success and growth. So the few things that have been stressed here around building trust, I think is fundamentally important. Building trust, I would say, being very evidence-based in strengthening the way we respond to change, in, a, in informing the way we re respond to change. That would be the second thread that I would underscore. Um, and, and then really working together to promote joint work in response to that change. I think those are kind of three key things that have come up. On the issue of building trust as an essential element for uh, change and reform and confidence and the manner of funding, what goes into that as a forward um, action for this group? It's you know working increasingly at the elements of trust, at openness, at transparency, um, and how do we leverage leverage kind of the UN's strengths in creating that as a convener, as a guardian of norms, as uh, an actor that can help promote coordinated analysis and work um, across issues or across borders. Um, that really underpins the Agenda 2030 and the SDG. So I think those parts of trust building and looking at the ways that the UN uniquely uh, contributes in the multilateral system in partnership, as Suzanne emphasized very correctly with the other uh, elements of the system. So we get to scale in, in that response. Um, the second part on gathering evidence as part of um, managing and optimizing change uh, is really you know, what underpins the work that we all do in um, what we've talked about today in these various reports, studies, the one that I summarized at the beginning, but also the work that um, Silke and Suzanne and Pele all represent in, in the work that their various institutions have done. That evidence base is essential in helping us stay on track on the type of policy and operational and action change that uh, results in this better quality um, decisions in the interests of those that we serve. So uh, that's the second one. Third, on how we really work together to promote joint work that's essential for that change to happen. So um, that means, you know, really leaning in and working together around the existing joint frameworks we have globally and at country level, um, really strengthening that shared sense of ownership and responsibility, you know, so that's where in the report we get at the kind of joint responsibility in a world of disarray, but it's joint responsibility and mutual benefit. Um, and so these kind of joint frameworks, joint work, and therefore joint funding arrangements um, can really help strongly underpin that. And then um, last point within there would be making sure that in what we refer to as quality funding for results, as Pe Pear was saying, identification of those results very sharply, having the evidence behind them, um, but also looking at what type of funding for what type of function. So not losing sight of the, fact of the importance of core uh, and assess funding for institutions uh, across the board. The compact builds that in but we're not in a strong place on that. So the, the core funding has an important part of quality going along with the flexible uh, pooled and interagency funding to promote that joint work. And they come together and they're not meant to be interchangeable or either or, or one feeding off the other. Um, so I really think those three things that the elements of building trust with the UN's particular role in there the evidence base, continuing to work on the evidence base behind that, and then continuing to reinforce the features and frameworks and uh, systems and tools that we have for joint work. I think, you know, those are the elements. Change isn't always easy, but really embracing it with the assets that we have, I think, is where um, where we have the opportunity to to really achieve the results that we set out for for the people we serve. So, thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And let me just quickly add, because so much has been said, that the findings of both our report and the, and, and the multilateral reports of OECD underline certainly that is not only about funding in terms of trends of levels and so on, but just exactly where you ended. But it's about the system and it's about the terms of quality 
that, 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 that we must understand financing. And listening to this discussion, we are, we are in the midst of an almost what we can see as a sort of a paradigm shift. Last time this happened, that was bringing on increased commitments and effectiveness of the whole development system. And this time, we are facing different issues. But I, I still think this discussion has focused a lot of the positive things. Um, and a lot of where we need to stay constructive. The, the OECD report identifies several paradoxes, and, and I, it struck me when listening to this that you know, we could probably add a few more just from this discussion. While re research point to the need to increase focus on investing in multilateral capacity and responsible prevention, and that's regardless if that is on health or peace or environment, financing trends and decisions point in the other direction. And while we can clearly identify the need for a stronger multilateral strategies at country level, we also see sort of a multilateralization of bilateral aid. We see that the effects of earmarking in proliferation of projects, uh, and so it is certainly a trend that we must understand and also reverse. Um, and if we add perhaps also another brilliant OECD report to this, the state of fragility report that was launched in, in September, we also know where we must increase our engagement with higher tolerance of risk. But at the same time, we see sort of an increase, increasing use of humanitarian action, uh, not reflected directly in peace building and state building development investments. So again, and, and also where, where Silke sort of pointed to in the end, to develop and strengthen the core UN system, the core funding must ensure this. But we also see a lot of funding uh, being channeled differently and a lot of that core funding being used for different purposes so you know there's so much that could be reflected over this rich discussion i'm very grateful for oecd for allowing us to 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 uh to hold this kickoff and for eric and for 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 olivia who's also been central for this but also on on the, the multi-partner uh, trust fund office sort of that, that you know all the support that we have in our long-standing uh, work for this it is, as uh, Hamakhan said, it's when we all play safe, when we create a world of utmost insecurity, and we must indeed sort of work together to stop that. So thank you very much for making this happen. And uh, we look forward to the continued discussions in, in, in this whole, you know, in, 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 in the other uh, side events that is organized in, 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 in relation to, uh, to this, this uh, OECD uh, program. So thank you very much. And with that, I think we should all close and uh, continue the work we do. So see you out there in other, in, in other forums, but on similar issues. So thanks for staying focused on this. Bye. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Uh, yes, bye. 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 Thanks bye. a lot. Bye.